When I was 19 years old, I started working at a community-based disability service provider. My first assignment at this agency was to provide in-home supports to three individuals, two teenage boys who were in the custody of the state of Arkansas who had the unfortunate label attached to them of being sex offenders. They received that label because they were children that had grown up in situations where they were mistreated multiple times by the people that were supposed to love and care for them more than anyone else in this world. And then they entered into a system where they were continued to be mistreated by the people that were paid to and volunteered and came to this work out of the goodness of their heart. And so these young men learned a norm that they shouldn't have learned and then reenacted things that were done to them to other people. The label gets applied to them. The third person that I was assigned to work with was a nine-year-old little girl who was diagnosed with autism and was nonverbal. At 19 years old, I promise you, I was not prepared in any way whatsoever for these three people. And they challenged me in ways that really only one of two things could happen. Either they challenged me in a way that would convince me that I really couldn't deal with people and would move off to some remote desert somewhere, or they would challenge me in a way that I would begin to see humanity and the value of human beings in a way that would affect the rest of my life. So almost 15 years later, I'm the deputy CEO at that organization, so you can guess which outcome came of that. I want to tell you just a little bit about some of these challenges, particularly that I received from this nine-year-old little girl. Nine years old little girl, right? What, how bad could it be? Before I started working with her, I heard about her. You know, someone said, hey, I hear you're going to work with her. Man, are you sure? Like, that was the face. That was the interaction that I got. And I was like, she's nine. She's cute. She's little. The girl. How hard could this be? Oh, my goodness. The first day that I met her, she came to my home for what we call respite services. It was my job to take care of her for the weekend. And I learned very quickly that this human being understood people probably better than anybody else that I'd ever met. She had to. You see, she had been in state custody since she was practically a baby. She was born to a 14-year-old mother who herself had an intellectual disability and was by no way, shape, or form prepared to take care of any child, much less this child with such significant needs. This child who was never settled. This child who never slept. This child who screamed constantly. One of the many factors that influenced this child being taken into state custody was that on one night, with no sleep, no support, no assistance, her mother decided in a clouded fog that it probably would be better to send her baby to heaven. So she turned the oven on, and she found a pot that the little girl would fit in, and she put the pot in the oven. Luckily, there was a family member that came in and saved the child. Ironically enough, several years later, I would meet another child whose mother did almost the same thing for the same reasons. This little girl had had, by the time I met her at nine, most likely hundreds of caregivers come into her life that just were not equipped. And she learned that she had to make people prove themselves. She learned that she had to test the people in her life. And she also learned that not everyone responded to the same tests. It wasn't enough to be unidimensional in the way you challenged people. I work with a lot of kids in state custody, and lots of them learn a good tool. This behavior is a disrupting behavior. This little girl learned that one tool is not enough, because you'll meet someone who's stubborn at 19 that says, that won't work on me. So you have to have something else. She had everything. 
She was physically aggressive. She hit, she scratched, she headbutt, she screamed. And for those people that were physically capable of dealing with her, she would, was very creative with her behaviors. She learned that the people that might be strong enough to deal with your physical aggression are not strong enough to deal with your body fluids. So she would smear feces. She learned how to make herself vomit. I have seen grown men cry at the hands of this little girl. And the first night that I spent with her, I looked in the mirror at one point, and it's the only point in my life I can ever remember doing this. I looked in the mirror and I said, I'm afraid you've bitten off more than you can chew. But I stuck it out because I'm really stubborn. I don't, I don't like for someone to get the upper hand on me. And that's really what it became about with her, right? Here I am in the spar with this nine-year-old little girl just trying not to get beat. But we made it through that night. And her support staff came and picked her up the next morning, thank God. <laughs> and I laid down in rest on the mat in my front door, slept, till she came back that night. When she walked through the door that night, she looked at me, almost like as to say, you're still here? Yes, I'm still here. She took my hand, she took me to the bathroom, she loved the bath, she loved to play in water. She drugged me in there and made me turn the bath on. And almost 15 years later, she's still a part of my life. She's an adult now, she lives in her own apartment. She receives support services through my organization. And there's probably not a person in the world that makes me any more proud than the life that she lives. The lessons that I've learned from my relationship with her and hundreds of individuals that have come after her have shaped and formed the way that I view humanity. And they've also revealed to me how society oftentimes incorrectly views humanity. You see, in our society, we are very prone to categorize people in one of three categories. We want our people to be heroes or victims or villains. And we're genuinely not comfortable accepting the fact that we all are all of those things. That when we talk about human beings, when we talk about human value, we have to embrace the fact that each and every one of us are in all of those categories. There are not three separate categories. Hero, victim, and villain are all of us. It's a part of living. When you look at these categories and you look at how they impact the way we view ourselves, and you look at the way they impact the way we view each other, you see a huge detriment in our interactions with one another, in our ability to make an influence on the world, and in our ability to allow the world to make an influence on us. Start with the idea of a hero. The greatest among us falter. This is absolutely true, 100%. There is not a person that has ever walked the face of the earth. No matter how wonderful, no matter how impactful their contributions, no matter what they have done to better us, there's not a single soul that has walked the face of the earth that has not faltered. Some of our greatest figures from history have done terrible things. If you look at some of the classic examples when you say heroes, you think of names like Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa. History tells us that Martin Luther King had extramarital affairs and that Gandhi was sexually abusive and physically and emotionally abusive of the people that followed him. That Mother Teresa, while she did so much work for the poor and the disenfranchised, she also believed that it was necessary that people stay poor and disenfranchised, because she viewed her work as serving God, and without someone who needed that service, she wouldn't be fulfilled. Now, do these things take away from what these people did? 
Do they take away from the positive contributions that these heroes made in our lives? Absolutely not. But they do illustrate the fact that even the best among us falter. Let's talk about victims for a minute. The weakest among us conquer. In my line of work in disability services over the last several years, we've done a lot of work, particularly in this community, to reach out beyond just our world to the service worlds around us. We've done a lot of work with support services for, for domestic violence, support services for sexual assault. And what we learn is that when we use this concept of victim, we wind up trapping people in the infractions that have been done against them. When you label someone as a victim, when you label them as weak and unable, you trap that person where they are. A friend of mine, several years ago, was a gentleman who had cerebral palsy, had significant physical limitations. And he was faced with some medical issues and a medical decision. This was an individual who could not speak, and he was able to communicate using a device. He was able to communicate using his attitude. Um, but he, he was faced with a medical choice to have a procedure done and become physically dependent more so than he was, or to say his goodbyes and leave this world. And the process that he went through to make those decisions was fascinating. The process that his family went through as he made those decisions was fascinating. So many people wanted to victimize him. So many people said to his family, you have to not let him make the wrong decision. They refused to victimize him. They refused to keep him in that position of weakness, and they allowed him to make his own decisions. And he decided that he would rather say his goodbyes and end his life with a level of independence that was really what life was all about for him. It was the most important thing for him. And then when we talk about our villains, I've known lots of villains. I have meaningful relationships with individuals that unfortunately carry some of the worst labels of our society. Murderer sex offender, arsonist. And there's not a single one of those, per, those individuals, there's not a single one of those relationships that has not enriched my life. Some of the biggest, tightest bear hugs I have ever gotten in my life have come from some of the people with the worst reputations. Some of the hardiest gut chuckles, biggest belly roll laughs, that I've ever engaged in have come from the people that the rest of the world don't want to share space with. I recently went and visited with a young man who, again, someone who had come from very torrid background, very negative circumstances, and had done some really bad things. And I went to see him, and I asked, he was at a, a, an inpatient hospital, and I asked for him, and I asked to be able to meet with him. And the nurse that was supposed to be helping me said, I, you, you can't meet with him. You can't be alone with him. Yeah, I can. Go get him. She said, I'm sorry, I don't think you understand what he's capable of. It is precisely because I understand what he's capable of, all that he's capable of, that that young man is less of a danger to me than he is anyone else in this world. The people who we categorize and we label are oftentimes the people that can enrich us the most. The key is, that we have to engage. When we engage the people in our worlds, maybe you've never met anyone that smears feces. Congratulations. <laughs> but I know that you've met people that challenge you, people that are hard to deal with, people that scare the life out of you. Those people are opportunities for you. 
But you can't connect and you can't be enriched unless you engage those people. Well, how in the world do you do that, right? The first step is you have to recognize the box that you have put them in. I, I had a caseworker ask me one day, do you want me to send you his list of charges and convictions? I said, I promise you that his list of charges and convictions tell me more about his circumstances than they do about him. So you can keep that. You have to identify within yourself when you react to that person for whatever reason. Maybe it's not their charges. Maybe it's just the way they dress or the way they carry themselves. But whatever it is, whatever it is that makes you react, you have to first recognize that you put them in that box, that you put them in that category. And then you just have to remove the box. It's just that simple. For many of us, just acknowledging that this is how I'm thinking about you is enough to make me stop thinking that way about you. I read a, a CrossFit Journal blog the other day where a CrossFit coach was talking about one of his clients who's a celebrity. And he was marveling about the fact that when people met this guy, they would go up to him and they would stand up straight and they would look him in the eye and they would shake his hand. And he said it was fascinating. This guy's a celebrity. So people, people would come up to him and they would behave in a totally different way. And he said, I wonder what would happen if we treated everyone we met that way. I tell you what would happen. We would all grow together. When we engage people, even the worst of people, we grow together. This is TED Talk. You hear the word compassion at TED Talk often. When I think about compassion, sometimes I get frustrated with the idea that we look at compassion like this is something that I have, and then I hand it off to you who are in need. That's not what compassion is about. Gregory Boyle, who wrote the book Tattoos on the Heart, talks about his experience supporting gang members in L.A., he says that compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a covenant between equals. In order for us to achieve that covenant, we have to recognize the boxes that we put people in, the categories that we automatically sift them into, and remove those and engage. Thank you.